Welcome to the latest in my weekly series of uh, webinars here at Epic Street. A special thanks, as always, to everyone at Epic Street for making this event possible and for inviting me back. <laughs> Glad to be back. Really enjoy doing these events. Uh, first, let me clarify the purpose of this event is education. I'm not going to provide specific privilege or recommendations per se, but I will take a look back at um, uh, generally take a look back on these events at. Uh, uh, the week that's transpired, both from a price action perspective on major currency pairs, also look back at the major news, and especially, and I want to make sure I, uh, I uh, devote enough time to this uh, in the next hour or so, uh, especially I want to devote time to uh, some key events that we face in the next uh, several days, partic particularly tomorrow. The uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke due to speak at a, at a uh, make us deliver a speech at, a, at a, an event for central bankers in Jackson Hole, Wyoming in the U.S. I've got four things on my list here, four, uh, four specific topics on my list. Uh, I'm going to take a look at at least one, perhaps two at most, uh, recent trades. I might focus on today because uh, up to this point in the week, the, the price action, at least up and through uh, today's New York morning session, has been rather ho-hum. Uh, some of you may have identified some uh, some decent trades in, uh, in the past uh, three days, but it's I mean, there's been some trades to be had. By and large, it's been a uh, rather humdrum sort of week as we wind down uh, summer vacations in many parts of the Western world in particular and as the market awaits this, uh, some of these key events that I'll not discuss during the course of the session. Uh, but there's a couple of trades I've had in mind to, for today, for example, that I'll discuss briefly. The nature of the trade, the uh, so actually one of the news stories, for example, that seemed to spark the uh, move, which made the trade very profitable. Uh, second point, and my second are four points. So let me uh, actually let me type these in the room so make sure they get uh, uh, you have something to refer back to. So uh, number one, uh, recent trades. Oops, let me type that again. Number one, recent trades. Uh, my second, uh, uh, hopefully four points here. Uh, correlation. Or I'll just leave it at that. Correlation. There's be some recent changes in correlation of uh, particularly one currency pair, more generally speaking, one currency, versus something that uh, I know many uh, uh, FX traders have uh, assessed and expected uh, and, and reserved correlation between one currency pair and the market, and I'll get that in a little bit. Uh, third point, I already mentioned uh, briefly, I made mention briefly of a, uh, of a speech by Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke at a, a conference for central bankers in, being held in Jackson Hole, Wyoming right now. Actually, the, today is the first day of the conference. Tomorrow, Bernanke delivered his uh, uh, annual Jackson Hole speech, so uh, let's call this Bernanke. That's my, my third point, my third focus point for the day. Fourth and final focus point, uh, can anyone guess it? <laughs> What's happening? What, what key event um, – I'll call it an event. What key event will uh, occur between now and my next webinar here next Thursday? What, where might the folk, market's focus lie? I'm talking about uh, news, major news events here. Anyone have any idea? Major news event over the next so several days. Let me give you a clue. It's, it's, not, it's not here in the U.S. It's across the pond. Now, I already mentioned Jackson Hole. No, that's, that's, that's not it. Again, across the pond. I, I'm, I'm here in the U.S., by the way. I should have provided some context. So I live here in the U.S. I just referred to one event here in the U.S., which is the Jackson Hole. Well, well, okay. Let's, uh, to keep us, in order to keep this process moving, let's, uh, let's, let's, I'll give it to you, ECB, European Central Bank. I'll talk about the ECB and what they might bring next week. Okay, first, uh, trades. What trades have unfolded recently here? Well, we discussed during my New York morning session today at our New York uh, uh, FX training room at FX Bootcamp uh, a couple of opportunities. Actually, more than a couple, but I'll, 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 I try to keep it brief because I want to devote the sufficient time to the uh, other topics here. Uh, we took a look at this. Uh, I'm showing you a chart without indicators for the euro. I'll turn off the auto scroll so I can back this chart up a bit. And what we talked about, actually, it was about uh, 30 minutes or so before this point in time. This is around, the, what, the 1030, uh, 1030 or so in, in the morning, New York time. What is this, what, some three or four hours ago? 15-minute chart for the euro. 
we talked about the nature of recent price section. Let me activate my drawing tool here. And we, we boxed in, um, let me shoot, I gotta try this again. There we go. We talked about this, this range, something like that. This 25, 35 to 40 area, which is put a floor under the euro. And then a ceiling for the euro in, in past days as well. And if you look at uh, price action before and after today's London session open, you got some notable tops here. Now, in terms of trading this, you have some options. You could buy at support, buy around 25.35, 25.40. You could sell at the resistance. Either you sell around the 25.55 zone. We've seen, again, some recent tops there. Or perhaps you're waiting for a rise higher to a point such as uh, yesterday's high near 25.70 uh, 70 to 75. I recall last Thursday's high established on the euro, closer to 25.85. Perhaps you're waiting for a rise to a higher level like that. I see a lot of references by a lot of the currency analysts to 1.26, and rightfully so. There's a, there's a case they made for notable resistance at or just above that psychological level. But in, just in terms of recent price action, there's a case they made for just scalping this range. Sell at the top, buy it back at the bottom. I mean, it's a modest range, what, 30, 35 pips, but a tradable range for the intraday trader who likes to take you know, short terms or what we call scalp type trades. Now, another option, it, rather than take, rather than say, buy down here and, 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 uh, and close the trade up there or vice versa, sell up here and buy down there, what you can do, what's always a possibility is, uh, let me reset the drawing tool here and redraw this again. You can always do something like this. If your bias is up, and not crazy to, uh, to define your bias is up on this pair, given price action since late July, which has been more up and down. You could have buy it somewhere in this 25, 35, 25, 40 zone in the hopes that we eventually break up, broke above those highs and at least challenge yesterday's high up here. So, you know, buying around 25, 35, 25, 40, targeting at least 25, 70, 25, 75. That was a viable option. So in other words, rather than play this range, you could buy at, at the bottom of this recent trading range today in the hopes we break above the range, break, break out of the range. Vice versa, same approach. If you think if, if you think this um, this area is going to hold here for some reason, you see observe in which we have had a, a recently series of lower highs on this pair, which I can back up and show you on an hourly chart. We have last Thursday's high there. You don't struggle to make it above 2570 zone there, another high there, lower high here. You can say, well, maybe the euro is overdone. You look to short. Okay, great. Again, the option there, short around that 2555 to 60 zone near today's London session highs and hopes we break below that uh, support zone. Oh, by the way, that, this is a good uh, opportunity for me to explain uh, or to me to show you some price action, uh, which suggesting to me that the 25-35-25-40 zone has been influential to the euro. So let me uh, zoom out a little bit here. And this may even be, a, I know there's a lot of lines in this chart, and I apologize for any confusion that may cause, but uh, there should be enough price action here to, uh, to get the point. The post-FOMC meeting minutes highs. So, the, so the, the, here's the euro's reaction to release after after last Wednesday's London close of the minutes of the recent FOMC meeting. The high of that move uh, in the 2535 to 2540 zone, we, talk, we talked about during my coaching session last Thursday, uh, along around 2535 to 2540. So that, that, that zone became support last Thursday. That zone was resistance um, here earlier in the week. It was support there, support there. You get the idea. This 2535 to 2540 zone, represented by two horizontal green lines at the top of this chart, it's had a notable influence on the euro. So that's the basis for that. Going back now to the 15-minute chart. In today's case, it was the bears that won. Yeah, trader, if I'm talking too loud, I can tone down a little bit. I've, I've been... Uh, advise that uh, I'm a bit on my microphone's settled a bit on the loud side. Uh, you sh you should if you have uh, any speakers you should have ways to uh, 
either tone down your speakers or if you're listening to me on a headset, uh, there should be ways on your own PC to turn down the volume. <clears throat> and by the way, when it comes to um, uh, my volume, I, I'd, I'd rather come across as too loud where some, uh, some of you, if I am too loud on your PCs or on your headsets, like you can turn down the volume as opposed to being too soft and people tr crank out of the volume and still have struggling to hear me. So I do, my, my, my mic is, is set on a bit on the, uh, a bit on the high side for that purpose. <clears throat> well, today it was the, uh, it was the Euro Bears. It was the Euro Bears that won out. We had, actually, we discussed this. It's, it's, um, it's worth, so we had a worthy discussion, interesting discussion during today's New York morning session. We had a trader in our room who uh, was waiting on a short closer to about, I think, 25.60. Let me put a line there. I've got a horizontal gray line almost right at 1.2560. This trader was looking for looking to enter right there at 2560, maybe maybe a pip or two higher. Now I, I didn't rec I don't recall the reasons, but whatever the case, that this trader was looking for a short. Let me zoom in on this short a little bit. This trader was looking for a short right there, or actually you know right here. Notice how price fell just a pip or two shy of his targeted entry, and then shot down. Well, the shot down, it, it might have had something to do with other things, but uh, what, I, what I found interesting was that this, this sharp drop in the euro seemed to re, uh, be a, a response to um, a comment by the uh, Slovakian prime minister. I'm sure the uh, comments by the Slovakian prime minister are um, something everyone focused on every single day. By the way, that's a joke. <laughs> Not very often the Slovakian by Mr. Moves the Market. Uh, there were reports that were released uh, soon before this sharp sell off on the euro. A report hit the news wires uh, that, uh, you, that the uh, Slovakian Prime Minister, Robert Fico, I think Fico, Fico, I, I'm mispronouncing his last name, Horst. anyway, the Slovakian Prime Minister reportedly said that, uh, uh, that he's not only worried about the eurozone collapse, but actually uh, pinned odds. Odds of the eurozone breakup at 50-50, at 50-50 odds of eurozone breakup in the, in the again in the view, in the opinion of the Slovakian prime minister. Euro sells off. Admittedly, a, a, an unpredictable sort of event, un, unless uh, the Slovakian prime minister was already was already uh, in the process of delivering a scheduled speech, which I personally wasn't aware of. Anyway, my, my point is this: number one, I mean, missing such trains can happen. Uh, number two, the, 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 the sensitivity of the market to events out of Europe should be very evident given this move. I mean, this is, folks, this is not the first time we've seen uh, a rather unusually uh, uh, strong move relative to previous price action on the euro. And the euro was basically stuck in a 30 pip range for much of the trading day. And then, boom, we, we have some comment by uh, a, a leader of Slo Slovakia. No offense to Slovakians, but it's not the leader of Slovakia. That's uh, prompted uh, any kind of move like this in the in the in the market, not just the currency market, but uh, several markets will sort off in response to that. Uh, it, it, to me, it's indicative of a few things. Number one, it is a, these are thin market conditions we're in right now. There's fewer buyers and sellers in the market, and so sometimes you get a a move that's sparked by news, you get an exaggerated move. So that part that could be part of the story here, a somewhat exaggerated move, perhaps triggering some some stops, um, in a thin market. Another factor here, another factor here is uh, sensitivity, again, to um, events out of Europe. This is not the first time we've seen an, an, uh, a seemingly unusual, strong, unusually strong move in response to uh, something which, frankly, isn't anything new. I mean, this isn't the first uh, uh, person, probably even not even the first uh, uh, notable leader of the Eurozone, that has either directly or perhaps indirectly uh, speculated on the possibility of uh, a eurozone breakup. That's not the first time this has happened. Not the first time this this concept has been floated, and yet the uh, the euro sells off. I have a I showed a graphic to our traders in a room. I'll show my drum up now. It's a graphic I've shown in the past on the, on our blog at fxbookcap.com. This, this graphic is going to show price action on the euro USD late last month. Looking for the graphic now. 
Well, where is it? Here we go. In this graphic shows price action, an hourly chart for the euro USD showing price action uh, Wednesday, July 25th, Thursday the 26th, Friday the 27th. As I've discussed before, we had the uh, sharp move up on the euro on Thursday the 26th in response to a, uh, a speech delivered by EC President Mario Draghi. I'll refer, again, I'll refer to that Draghi speech a little bit later in this, in this webinar and also refer to uh, an article he uh, he wrote, uh, uh, actually wrote before yesterday, but it was published yesterday on the ECB's website and also in a German uh, National Weekly pu uh, publication. But the, the point I especially want to make in this case was uh, that next day, Friday, we saw some notable Euro reactions to uh, especially a statement when it hit the news wires, a, state, a joint statement by uh, German Chancellor Merkel and French President Hollande. They issued a statement during that, uh, that, th that Friday, July 27th, New York morning session. They issued a joint statement essentially stating that they would do anything to protect the Eurozone. Not, nothing new, nothing shocking, and yet uh, we saw on the short-term charts on the Euro, like on a one-minute or five-minute chart, the Euro responded virtually immediately. The moment that, news, that, that, that comment, that statement hit the news wires, boom, the Euro jumps. Whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, this, this market is, has been ultra-sensitive to events out of Europe, and it, it, it's one of the reasons why it's my opinion that in a, it's one of the takeaways here for this, uh, for this particular webinar. Then when it comes down to, uh, you know, what's, what's influencing the market the most these days, you, you have some, a number of events to pick from or a number of uh, fundamental uh, scenarios to choose from that can, that can affect the markets in the coming days and weeks or even months. Uh, there's the U.S. Is the U.S. going to uh, uh, see a sustained recovery? Is the Federal Reserve, for example, going to uh, uh, initiate uh, another quantitative easing program, dubbed now QE3, or maybe some some, some variation of that? Uh, there's the China story. Is China in for a hard landing or soft landing? I'm going to get to the China story in just a moment. And then there's the uh, the situation in Europe. Uh, you know what's going to happen with Greece? The so-called Troika is going to visit with Greece uh, uh, next month. Uh, the, the Germans, among others, are waiting for a report about the, uh, the status of the, you know, the current uh, uh, progress or not being made by the Greeks on their austerity measures. Uh, you have Spain. Spain hasn't uh, uh, fessed up to needing a bailout yet. Uh, uh, the Spanish Prime Minister says he's, uh, he's awaiting some details on any bond buying program by the ECB. And you know, of course, there's again speculation still, as uh, as confirmed by this uh, pr uh, comment today by the Slovakian Prime Minister, that you know, is the eurozone going to remain intact? So, of those three areas, uh, let's call it you know, U.S., China, Europe, I mean, Europe is where the uh, where the market's focus is. Not entirely. I mean, not saying the other events events related to the U.S. or or, or related to the Fed or events out of China can't uh, affect the market. So right now, the market's focus, right or wrong, is, is predominantly Europe, in my humble opinion. <clears throat> so again, a logical trade there on the euro during today's New York morning session. We also talked about an Aussie short. And this is my segue to... Um, uh, my the correlation discussion, which I promise you will be able to go. I'm looking at an hourly chart for the Aussie. Is, is it just me or has anyone noticed the Aussie's been under, under undue selling pressure of late? Anyone notice some, some, uh, some rather persistent selling pressure on the Aussie over much of this month? It can't be just me. We talked in my New York morning session about uh, a couple of different options for shorts on the Aussie. Uh, you have the 1.0380 zone, which has been important in the past. If you look at a weekly chart for the Aussie USD, you can see some examples of um, how the Aussies flip from either from up to down or from down to up in the 1.0 to 80 area. I don't show it here, but if you look at a weekly chart, you're going to see some examples of that. Uh, we talked about the possibility, if we got there, of a rise up to 1.04 to the psychological level. We saw the Aussie flip there yesterday, but we also talked about, in addition to those opportunities, we also talked about because of the of the nature and with the seemingly aggressive nature in which the market has sold the Australian dollar against the U.S. dollar, we also talked about this short. See that horizontal bright red line in the middle of this chart? 
see the low there established a couple of days ago. That low just a smidge above 1.0340. We talked about a sell there. And I don't know if we actually touched that low, but we came within a, probably a micro pip or so of that low right here. You all sold off a little bit. Then we got the comments by the Slovakian Prime Minister, broad dollar strength. Boom, down, down it went, back eventually below 1.03, reached uh, nearly 1.0275. So, Andy, uh, good, uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you for the participation. Thank you for the comments. Andy noticed that the, uh, the dump of the Aussie. Yeah, a Andy's on the right track with there. Absolutely, Andy. I'll, here's, here's a good segue again to my, uh, uh, my second topic, which is uh, correlation. Up through, uh, I'd say, early August, especially through, through, through July and early August, it seems the Australian dollar was uh, showing some unique strength. And I've talked in past webinars here about, you know, some of the reasons beyond, behind that. You know, it could have been, um, well, you know, up until that time, uh, until like uh, late July, early August, we've seen rising equities. As part of the story, there's been a, a historical correlation between the Aussie and the equity markets, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, bond yields are, are often a factor behind uh, uh, overall Australian dollar strength, uh, that is bond spreads. Uh, the Australian, uh, Australian government bonds enjoy a yield advantage over um, uh, government bond yields in uh, several other developed economies, like uh, Germany, like the U.S., for example. Uh, another factor, well, just, you just if you just look at the Australia's role in terms of uh, it's being a, a provider of uh, several commodities, iron ore, coking coal for the steel industry in, in China. Um, it's that's another factor as well beyond why the Australian dollar, why the Australia has uh, attracted a um, a lot of money. But let's uh, let's look at some correlations here. I'm going to show you a graph of uh, recent price action since late June on the Aussie USD currency pair versus the S&P 500 index futures. I'm going to make sure I get the right graph here, so bear with me. I've got several graphs I want to show you. Okay, yeah, this is the one I want to show you. Yeah, I guess you're comment about rare earth metals, the ones that the Chinese are sitting on. The one that we have, we have some of those, some of that, uh, some deposits of those in the Western United States, but uh, haven't tapped it recently. Okay, uh, let me explain this. What you're seeing here, I'm showing. Uh, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Nah, I don't want to zoom in too much. I'm showing that you, you, there's two candlestick charts here, overlaid on one, one on top of the other. The dark color candles. That's the Aussie USD. Dark color candles are, are the Aussie. The orange color candles are S&P futures. Actually, I wanted to show another. I should have shown another chart first, but I could start with this. Uh, maybe it's just me, but it seemed that this is showing the price action from late June, specifically June 27th, through uh, a Thursday, August 9th, and you, you'll see why I'm showing why I'm showing that particular span of time, especially up into August 9th, in a moment. Well, maybe it's just me, but it seems that there's a positive correlation here. In other words, it seems these these two charts, these two patterns of, of candlesticks, move in lockstep. As one goes up, the other goes up. As one, as one goes down, the other goes down. And I'll tell you what, I'm going to make a, another, uh, uh, I'm going to show you another uh, combination of charts here in a moment to explain this or to set the stage for explanation of that subgraph. So bear with me. I'm going to... Uh, I'll remove this graph for just a moment and show you a couple examples of a correlation. As soon as I can, uh, as soon as I can minimize this, uh, or put this graph back to size. Boy, I see really just really under pressure. I think it's here. Yeah, here it is. So I just showed you a graph of uh, the Aussie USD versus S&P 500 index futures, an example of positive correlation. Well, I've got another example, perhaps not the best example, but it is an example of uh, positive correlation. Uh, on this chart, the dark colored candles are for the Euro USD, the lighter colored candles are for the uh, for pound dollar. 
the pair known to many traders as cable. Now it's not perfect. They don't the two charts don't fit each other exactly like a glove. But it just seems that um, I'll highlight that here's the here's the here's the Euro USD I'm highlighting now. Some of the price acts on the Euro. And let me use a um, an orange colored marker to highlight uh recent price action on a cable, especially when starting here. Again, it's not perfect, but uh, the, the the two, generally speaking, moving in lockstep. Again, although they don't they don't perfectly match each other, the idea is with correlation, as one move up moves up, generally speaking, the other one moves up, and as a, as one moves down, the other moves down. These are four-hour candles, by the way, four-hour candles, Euro USD and uh, the pair known as cable. So this is an example, maybe, perhaps not the best example, but an example of positive correlation. Positive correlation. One measured correlation that the statisticians of the so-called quants like to use, a correlation coefficient. I won't, bur I won't burden you with a theory behind that or the, the nature of the, uh, uh, of the, of how, what's behind the calculation. Uh, I'll just suffice it to say that uh, we have, uh, the, the correlation coefficient, uh, involves numbers in a range from minus one to plus one. The closer the number is, the correlation coefficient to plus one, the stronger the positive correlation, the more two things like this move in lockstep. So again, the more lockstep they move in, the, the more they, the more two things, the more two charts like this mirror each other's moves, or not, maybe not mirror is actually the right analogy, and I'll show you an example of that in a moment. But the, the more that the, the two things, like cable, like the URSD, match each other's moves, the more positive the correlation, the closer the correlation coefficient to one. One is perfect positive correlation. In reality, most correlations could be a strong positive correlations could be uh, kind of a correlation coefficient, which I'll show you in a minute on the graph, uh, of like 0.7, 0.8, So there's positive, an uh, example of positive correlation. Negative correlation, example of that, a classic example of that. Uh, this chart, that wait, I'm waiting for the uh, the overlay indicator here to refresh in this chart. Now, you'll see in a moment, hopefully this will refresh sooner or later, you'll see in a moment some ladder color candles representing the um, uh, dollar Swissy currency pair. Well, this is slow to refresh. I hope, there we go, there we go. Got to refresh. So darker colored candles, Euro USD, lighter colored candles, dollar Swissy. Perhaps the best example amongst the major currency pairs of negative correlation. As one goes up, the other goes down. As one goes down, the other goes up. I haven't run the numbers on this one lately, but the, the, this is a, this is the kind of correlation whereby the, uh, the so-called the so correlation coefficient, uh, probably like minus 0.98. Very, very close to minus one. So again, a classic example here of, of strong negative correlation. Euro USD versus dollar Swissy. So keep that brief explanation of correlation in mind and the, and the, and the nature of the correlation uh, coefficient metric. Again, strong positive correlation, numbers like 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, close to 1. Strong negative correlation, negative numbers like minus 0 0.7, minus 0 0.8, minus 0 0.9, and, and, and lower on the um, correlation coefficient. So back, uh, actually, let me go back to my main view here first. So a quick review again of this graphic, and especially a discussion of the move of the moving correlation coefficient. So uh, again, these, it seems these two charts. You don't need to be a quant or a statistician to identify those two charts. Seem to be moving in lockstep. Sometimes the move moves up or the moves down are more exaggerated on the Aussie than the, on the S&P or Sometimes the move on the on the S P is a little more exaggerated than that on the Aussie. By and large, as one goes up, the other goes up. The other, as one goes down, the other goes down. And that's confirmed by this uh, what I what I call the five-day moving correlation coefficient. Now, what the heck is that? What in the heck is that? Well, let me explain it here. Let's look at, um, for example, you can see some ver vertical bars here. Some blue vertical bars. They range in value from about 0.5 up to almost like 0 0.98, 0 0.99. Let's look at the most recent value. Let me reset the, the color of this marker here. You can see right there, 
the most recent the, the bar that the vertical bar, blue bar which uh, pertains to a four hour candle established on the 9th of August that reading is uh close to 0 0.8 almost 0 0.8 so you know right in there now what does that single bar mean 0 0.8 it means that the correlation coefficient for the 30 four-hour candles, so the, for the 30 previous four-hour candles, if you take the closing prices of those candles and, and, and run the correlation coefficient, do the correlation calculation, that is the 30 closing prices for the Aussie USD four-hour candles and the 30 most recent closing prices for S&P 500 futures candles. If you run the correlation coefficient involving the closing prices of the prior 30 candles, uh, 40, uh, 30 four-hour candles is, is uh, it's roughly five days, if you do that, you get a correlation coefficient at that point in time of uh, about 0.8. Now, do you see where I'm going with this? What I'm doing over time is I'm taking snapshots. This graphic right here, taking snapshots of correlation. So the correlation here, for example, the reading of uh, about 0.5 here, that was the correlation of of uh, the uh, four hour, of the of the Aussie USD versus the, the uh, S&P 500 futures. The correlation from about here to I'm going to say roughly there. So, so the correlation between the Aussie and the S&P 500 futures in that time in that span of time over that frame of time is not as good as what it, it had been, but uh, still you know positive. And in the interest of time, I'll probably have to keep the, uh, continue, move on with the discussion here. Any questions about correlation, feel free to ask the question or send me an email separately, hurt at fxbookcap.com. I'll post my email address here in a little bit. Now let's take a look at this same graph, this the same chart and graph extended and forward in time to um, through yesterday's price action. I hope I'm picking the right graph here. I've got several graphs here that I've uh, created and annotated. I think it's this one. Uh, and I believe I'm correct. Here it is. Some points I want to make. First of all, even before I, I ran uh, did the correlation uh, calculations, even before I looked at some of the news in early August, which I'll refer to in a moment, and maybe it's just me, but you can't help but notice that the Aussie since it's, it's a double top around 1.06, the Aussie has been trending down. But look at the S&P futures. S&P 500 futures been generally moving up. Well, a little bit of a dip there, certainly, but the S&P futures has generally held up, held up better than the Aussie. Why is that? Now, I'm not sure this is the only explanation or perhaps even the best explanation of why. What I found interesting is this. Look at my, co my correlation subgraph down here, my, uh, my five-day moving correlation. See how the correlation just, just tanked, just cratered. It dropped sharply over the course of about one trading day. It dropped sharply on the day of, of August 10th. What happened during August 10th? Well, during the August 10th Asian session, we saw two data points out of China released, trade balance news and China new loans. What's the big deal about that? Well, think about uh, how... Uh, Think about the source of China's growth for, what, years here. One major source of growth, exports. Exports to the West, exports, for example, to Europe and the U.S. By the way, I believe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Europe is a larger, uh, is a destination of more exports from China than, than the U.S. has or has been until, until, of course, recently. So that's been one source of the, uh, the China growth model. Another source more recently, especially, I say recently, I mean in like the past several years, uh, investment. Investment in, say, infrastructure, investment in like uh, the property market. You know, have anyone heard about stories about these uh, so-called ghost cities in, in China? China has, uh, the Chinese have been building like, uh, you know, apartments and houses and, and, and office buildings. And, and there's been, again, I haven't confirmed to myself, but I, I know of some hedge fund, know of some hedge fund managers who reported visiting China, going to some of these places and seeing just uh, you know just you know, acres and acres and you know and blocks and blocks and city blocks full of uh, buildings that are largely unoccupied. Anyway, so the the, the point I wanted to make was there's been there's been 
two notable sources of, uh, of growth for China, exports to the West and uh, infrastructure, investment type spending. It's spending on, on things like uh, roads and, and bridges and, and railroads and stuff, but also um, investment in uh, uh, commercial and residential property. Now, the trade balance report released on August 10th, that addresses the, uh, the export picture. You know, what, how are exports doing? New loans, since the new loans data is important because uh, it's, uh, it's been, new loans have been a source for that, uh, that, that investment spending, that infrastructure spend. You know, what's been spent on, say, uh, uh, buildings and homes and you know, other things. So let's take a look at those data points, those, the data points that were released on, um, again, during the August 10th Asian session. First, the export data. See the dip on the far hand, right hand side of this chart. This graphic, this is a the source of the gra this graphic is a Bloomberg.com. You can see the um, the link at the bottom. You can't click on it now because it's not going to work. But if you uh, uh, if you email me or if you if you watch this if this a video later, uh, uh, Epic Street's going to archive this video. You can uh, copy down the um, the link there and then uh, go to see uh, uh, this graph yourself and even uh, monitor it over time. This graphic shows the year-to-year -year change in exports from China. And notice on the far right-hand portion of this uh, graph, we saw export growth in June right here, around 10%, a little about 10%. So from June of 2000, uh, 2011 to June of, of this year, there was a growth of a little more than 10% in, in China's exports. The July data, the July export data released on, again on August 10th, there's a J July data point, just above zero. Essentially no change. No change from the prior July. Very close to no change. So it's, it's a concern here that if you can see the trend here, the trend is down. The trend down is meaning that uh, the year to year change, the year to year growth in exports is slowing. Perhaps, and I stress the word perhaps, about to go negative. We might see a year-to-year -year contraction, year-to-year -year shrinking of exports. So again, this is, a, this is a sign that China, another sign, a recent sign, that China is perhaps slowing down, at least the export picture. Let's take a look at uh, that loans data. Actually, a similar story here. We've seen spikes in loans. And notice this, is a, this shows a five years' worth of uh, of China uh, new loans data in, in local currency. And let me activate the drawing tool here. The uh, the, the massive uh, China stimulus package uh, released in uh, 2009, you see evidence of that in here, spike in new loans. That stimulus package, by the way, the equivalent of uh, something like a $3 trillion stimulus in the U.S. That's how big, in relative terms, that stimulus package was to China, big stimulus package. And you see some spikes at the beginning of each of the uh, some recent years here. There's a, there's frequently a spike at the beginning of the year in uh, in loans, new loans by uh, China state banks. Or look at the, the recent dip in loans from uh, from Ju uh, July to I'm sorry from June to July. So there's concern some concern that uh, the Chinese banks are scaling back their loans as well. Oh, Andy, I agree. I, I agree. Andy makes a comment about the uh, Chinese announcement of the impact on the Aussie. Uh, I will I will add this. The, the, um, the, the Australian, uh, some of the Australian news reports can cause big initial moves. You can see you know, the, the Aussie move uh, 30, 40, 50 pips or more in a very short period of time in response to, say, Australian retail sales or an RBA, that's the Reserve Bank of Australia, the R, an RBA policy decision. And there's some other reports. So every once in a while, an inflation report will, um, out of Australia, will, will shake up the market a bit. But it's what's fairly rare is for that move to uh, to see a notable extension. But you, you see what I'm getting at here. Let's go back to the uh, the graphic I showed earlier. Again, maybe it's just me, but it, it could be it could be other factors beyond this, but. Uh, it, again, the correlation changed, and the Aussie has been more down than up following that China data released on August 10th. 
So something to watch, something to watch. Or, or another way to put it, if you, for those who have typically relied upon uh, moves in, say, S&P 500 index futures as a guide or gauge for what, for what the Aussie might do, uh, that gauge, that, that guide, not, for, not as reliable. Now, sometimes on a, on a given session or in a given hour, you'll see the, um, uh, the Aussie USD or some other Australian dollar pair and, say, S&P futures sort of move in lockstep. It does happen. It does happen. But I think it pays to recognize the broader theme, which is, has been recently um, the Aussie doing its own thing. Yeah, gamma. Uh, so, yeah, reality versus hope. That's a great way to put it, and I, I'd, I'd have to agree with you. Uh, the rise in the equities, the buoyancy, especially of U.S. equities, uh, part, uh, certainly part of its uh, hopes about more quantitative easing by the Fed. I saw a um, this was about an hour ago. I saw a, a frequent uh, um, a, a frequent commentator uh, at the New York Stock Exchange on CNBC, the financial news network here in the U.S. This guy said it was his opinion, and especially in, in the conversations with, with other traders on the New York Stock Exchange, the perception there, right or wrong, the perception there is that, uh, that uh, they think that some 80% um, of uh, QE, of QE3, has been priced in. In other words, uh, uh, you have, you have, some, sort of many of you have heard about the concept about you know, what markets priced in or not. Does you know, some event can be priced in completely or partially, whatever. Uh, the, the, the impression of uh, many stock traders on the, S, on the uh, New York Stock Exchange right now is that something like the market has, the, the stock market has priced in roughly maybe 80% of, uh, of, of the impact of, uh, of QE3 or expecting QE3. So expectations of more quantitative easing by the Fed. It's a good segue to my next, uh, my next, my final two points here. Expectations of more QE by the Fed, certainly a factor behind this, uh, the rise in stocks. There's some other factors, uh, that I've seen, uh, there's a report, I can't remember, I, I wish I could remember the, uh, the source of this. It was some, uh, some research firm or investment bank, I cannot recall who right now, that uh, did this research, but it was, it makes some notable points and, and backs by some empirical data. Uh, one source, perhaps, of, uh, the recent buoyancy, the recent rise in stocks, I'm gonna come up another graph here for you, uh, investment, uh, overseas investors. I've got a graph on this. Hang on a minute. Here we go. No, it's not it. Shoot, where is it? Pardon my silence. Here we go. This graph shows data since uh, early 2006. The black line. This this uh, this, uh, this black line shows SP 500 future uh, moves through, I believe, at least late July, perhaps early August. The black line is the S&P 500 index. The blue line, that's, uh, it's been labeled here, rest of world purchases of U.S. equities. Rest of world purchases of U.S. equities. Notice how it's been up since, uh, what, uh, third or fourth quarter of last year? So that's cited by some as a, a factor, perhaps a factor, a contributing factor behind the uh, rise in stocks. Uh, two of the factors, uh, perhaps the secondary or, or minor factors, short covering, perhaps some short covering by bears, by stock, by equity bears. Another factor, look at corporate balance sheets. I don't have uh, any graphic, uh, any funky looking graphic to show you here, but, uh, U.S. corporate balance sheets at the, by some measures, the healthiest, the, um, the, 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 the highest cash levels we've seen in like, uh, three or four decades. U.S. large U.S. corporations just loaded with cash right now, for the most part. And the, the, the theory or thinking here, and again, it's, it's largely specula mostly speculation. I haven't seen any uh, solid empirical data on this. Perhaps it's out there. The thinking is that uh, uh, large U.S. companies have been doing some stock buybacks, one way of rewarding shareholders, perhaps a way of uh, – making it easier for them to borrow in the market. So you name it. I mean, pick your, pick, your, pick your favorite reason. Maybe you have a different one. Expectations of QE3, uh, the, the, given the lift of the uh, U.S. equity markets, uh, corporate buybacks, uh, short covering, uh, in, investment or 
money flowing in the U.S. Uh, from foreign investors. Why? Well, again, um, you know, if you consider this, and this is another lesson that for uh, currency traders, I've seen countless scenarios where currency traders are just baffled by strength of, say, a British pound or weakness of another currency when that, 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 that strength and weakness wasn't justified by, say, in the, in the case of the British pound, I remember a, a member of boot camp last year saying, this, this pound strength makes no sense to me. The British pound at, 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 during one period last year was was so, so strong, and, and this trader was like, this makes no sense. Uh, things are horrible in my part of the, my neck of the woods, and this is kind of this trader lives in the UK. And uh, one one point, and that's not the only point. One point is that uh, it, it's not about, it's not, certainly not always about the state of that particular economy that that uh, uses the currency. It's it's more about money flow, and it's oftentimes about things like, you know, where's where's money best treated. Where, where's money best treated? In this environment of uh, so many developed economies showing slow growth, um, the, it's, not, it's not just the, uh, uh, the health of one's economy, the, the health of a single economy you should look at. It's, uh, you know, what, what, what drives money flow across borders? And uh, consider all, you got to consider also that um, uh, uh, some destinations look better than others, even though, uh, uh, even though certain economies, certain uh, uh, places, uh, certain industry sectors may not look so good, but if they look at least better, or if the prospects for economy or a country or an industry sector are better in comparison to other sectors or countries or economies, that it can and will attract money. In the case of currencies, can and will uh, affect the currency. I, I am actually, I expected to be at this point uh, far earlier, and this is so typical of me uh, running um, uh, short on time near the end, uh, end of the uh, session. Uh, emphasis here on um, obviously on tomorrow with the Bernanke speech. I want to cite uh, a key comment or a key statement, and uh, let me find this here. It was a statement in the recent released uh, FOMC meeting minutes. I meant to refer to this last week, but it's worth mentioning again, even if I did. Here, I got it. I'm going to post it in the uh, room. Andy, I would tend to agree with you. Uh, Andy made a comment earlier about uh, seriously doubting the Fed will introduce QE3 at Jackson Hole. Uh, the point I made, I made it made earlier, and if I didn't, it's, it's worth making now. Yeah, I think I made it earlier about, um, you know, where's the focus of the mark? I think the focus of the mark is more on, the, on Europe and the ECB than on Bernanke and Jackson Hole. Now, because there's nothing else going on, because we have a, a nearly a week from now before uh, we hear from the ECB, Jackson Hole is the focus tomorrow. Notice what I just posted in the room here. I posted a statement, actually two sentences, two sentences from the, the minutes of the recent FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee meeting, held July 31st and August 1st. Uh, it's it's uh, the first, especially the first sentence caught my uh, caught my attention. The first sentence. Many members judge the additional monetary accommodation. You can read the rest. Uh, what, what's the takeaway from that? Well, what strikes me is the fairly soon part. One thing that strikes me is the fairly soon part. Many members judge that additional monetary accommodation would likely be warranted fairly soon. That has a sense of, uh, at least a little bit of sense of urgency, a sense of, it's, a, a sense of, um, uh, of destiny, like it's going to happen. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when in, in the minds of many members of the FOMC. A strong clue in the perception of many that the Fed, it's only a matter of, it's a, only a matter of when. Not, I'm sorry, it's only a matter of, uh, yeah, it's only a matter of when, not a matter of if. Uh, in terms of whether or not a, a QE is going to happen, consider this, the, uh, the second statement. Several members noted the benefits of accumulating further information that can help clarify the contours of the outlook for the economy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, actually, an even better statement, which I didn't uh, haven't posted here. Let me see if I posted it. Uh, I've got a copy of this other statement here. I posted it in our room earlier today. Hmm. Hope I can find it.
Oh, here it is. I got it. Hold on. Sorry for the silence. Yeah, Andy, I would agree. The elections are a key factor there, I think. Maybe not the only factor, but uh, an important factor, nevertheless. So I just posted another comment. Actually, the uh, uh, another statement from the FOMC meeting minutes, a number of members indicated that additional accommodations could help foster more rapid improvement in labor market conditions and environment, blah, blah, blah. The point is this. Here's the point I'm making with uh, those two statements from the um, committee policy action section and the, and the latest FOMC meeting minutes. My take on all that is this. The Fed's poised to act. That certainly left the door open for more action. And if, 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 if those comments or those statements are an indication, the only thing that would um, prevent the Fed would, from eventually doing something would be a notable improvement in labor market. I mean, look at the look at the terms there. Uh, uh, substantial and sustainable strengthening in the pace of the economic recovery. Pretty strong language for central bankers, in my humble opinion. And, you know, it doesn't say you know, if things remain status quo, then we we do nothing. It, it, to me, that sound, to me that reads like um, the Fed's going to act unless unless there is there's, uh, we have see an improvement in things. Where would that improvement come from? Again, the labor sector. Uh, let's look at take a look at that. I've got a uh, a graph here on the latest NFP numbers, and I'll, I'll touch on uh, in just a minute. I'll touch on the ECB meeting. Where is my uh, NFP numbers? Okay, there we go. And we can talk about this a week from now uh, in the in my next uh, webinar here at Epic Street. But uh, I think this puts a lot of focus on next week's NFP report. We had a much better than expected uh, headline number from from the last NFP report for July, released early August. Uh, this, I think it will put a lot of attention on next week's NFP. Can we uh, match or even exceed the uh, July number for NFP? Or perhaps a watch for a revision to, to the July number. If the July number is revised down and the August number is uh, relatively subdued, as were the figures for April, May, and June, this is, uh, that, definitely, that, def that scenario definitely would boost the odds of more quantitative easing. And maybe not, as, as, as Andy applied, maybe not until after the election. See, if you're wondering what this, this election thing means, it would look politically awkward, let's put it one way, for the Fed Reserve to um, uh, to announce a, a policy easing measure, a major policy initiative like uh, like a QE3 program in, say, October, just about well, three or four weeks before a major U.S. election. It would look like the Fed's trying to uh, help out the uh, – the current can the, the current uh, president, which in this case uh, uh, the Obama, the Democrat. So to avoid that sort of scenario, the Fed may stand back. Another reason why the Fed may sit may sit tight for a minute, and perhaps a reason, although an, uh, not a direct reason, perhaps a reason why the Fed's uh, uh, got the, the the finger on the trigger, ready to put, to activate more easing, but hasn't done so yet. Uh, concerns about Europe. Uh, I, my guess is the Fed had the druthers. Uh, ECB would fall through for, with the major policy action, and the Fed uh, sees a gradual improvement in, in the labor market, and the Fed does nothing. And, oh, and also uh, the, the, the Congress would uh, get its act together near the end of the year after the election, um, to resolve at least at least delay the uh, fiscal cliff issue. If uh, I'm guessing if Bernanke and his peers at the FOMC had their choice, that would be a, a, a not a, like this, a, a desired scenario. Heron said that keep your eye on Bernanke tomorrow. He may make he might make references to uh, uh, different uh, policy options, such as uh, reducing the interest rate on express reserves. Uh, uh, again, I, if I had, I, I, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just to cut the chase here. I see a possibility of the dollar strengthening tomorrow on the back of at least modest disappointment that the Bernanke doesn't sound any more any bolder than someone like to see. So a dollar rally on the back, and you know what, some, to some degree. Maybe some of that's already being priced in with this uh, sell-off today, although the sell-off is seemingly tr triggered by the uh, Slovakian Prime Minister's comments. And uh, my, uh, my time is very short, but I can make one more point. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the article from yesterday's uh, uh, 
a German we a public, weekly publication. You can see it on the EC's website as well. I tweeted about it yesterday. Uh, the article by um, uh, Draghi is worth a read. Here's the point that Draghi made, and I can, uh, I can read it to you verbally. The article is titled, you can Google this, The Future of the Euro, Stability Through Change. The Future of the Euro, Stability Through Change. And as I, you may recall I discussed earlier that the spike up on the euro in late July in response to uh, comments by Draghi. ECB's President Mario Draghi uh, said it's, uh, something to the essence of believe it will be enough in reference to uh, a policy move by the ECB to um, uh, support the, uh, uh, the major bond markets like the Spanish and Italian bond markets in Europe. Uh, one key phrase, so one key uh, statement from that uh, article, and I'll wrap up with this, from the article but written, uh, published by, uh, written by Draghi, published yesterday, the ECB will do what is necessary. The ECB will do what is necessary to ensure price stability. Blah blah blah. And then it goes on. Mark Draghi goes on. Fulfilling our mandate, fulfilling the ECB's, ECB's mandate, sometimes requires us to go beyond standard monetary policy tools. When markets are fragmented or influenced by rational fears, our monetary policy signals do not reach citizens evenly across the euro area. We have to fix, this is, again, this is Draghi's words, we have to fix such blockages to ensure a single monetary policy and therefore price stability for all euro area citizens. This may at times require exceptional measures. By all indications, I know this is me speaking, by all indications, uh, and of course Draghi uh, skipped, he's not making the trip to Jackson Hole to speak on uh, Saturday, which he was a business skeptic to do. All that points to uh, Draghi and the folks at ECB got something in the works. Major bond buying initiative, some, some policy move. A lot of focus on the ECB's uh, policy, uh, introductory statement during the press conference next Thursday. Uh, that's, that's, I think that's, that's, that's going to be one of the major game changers. If it's going to be a game changer next month, uh, in terms of uh, sentiment for or against the euro, it's right there, the Draghi um, statement next, at next week's ECB press conference. And Andy mentions the NFP report. Uh, again, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, the NFP will uh, attract a lot of attention, especially if um, Drag, or especially if, uh, if uh, Bernanke makes any references during the speech to the labor market, which I suspect he will. In addition, by the way, I expect uh, uh, expect the Bernanke to make some references to uh, some of the things that, again, he's done this before, but he can do it again. References to things that Congress can and should do, at least in his mind address the fiscal cliff issue and perhaps some other structural changes to the U.S. economy. The thing about Bernanke, and this again, this is good, the, 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 could be the reason why the, the, the market sells off um, and we see some dollar strength perhaps in, in the wake of uh, the release of uh, the text for Bernanke's speech tomorrow. Uh, Bernanke essentially make a, make a point like this. We're here to help. We will do more easy if necessary, but here's what we, like, here's what we prefer to see. We first see Congress do this and that and the other thing. And perhaps uh, Europe stabilizes, blah, blah, blah. So, again, a Fed ready to act, but perhaps not as soon as the market would like, could spark a dollar, a dollar rally tomorrow. Dollar rally, very common and when the market uh, is disappointed about the prospect of, uh, at least in the near term, no Fed action. And that uh, con um, comprises my uh, one hour. I hope this has helped in some way. I actually wanted, I wanted to, to discuss a, a few more details about um, the Fed and about the ECB. I, I covered the, the gist of it, I believe. Focal points again for the next several days, uh, Bernanke speech tomorrow, the ECB press conference uh, next Thursday. Thank you very much for your attendance, for your attention, for your time. Thank you especially to, uh, to um, all the fine folks at, uh, at Epic Street for making this event possible and for inviting me back. Uh, you can send me an email if you have any questions or comments. I welcome them. I encourage them. I, I Please send them. Kurt at epicsbootcamp.com. I'm typing that in the room right now. There you go. Have a great day, folks. And uh, be, be careful tomorrow. Seriously, be careful tomorrow. It could be uh, we could see some fairly choppy price action, not just in the EURUSD, but in multiple markets, multiple currency pairs. Cheers. <laughs>